Today, there are hundreds of pyramids still standing all over the world from India to Peru, cultures separated by the Atlantic who supposedly never discovered each other's existence, built these giant triangular structures, aligned them to cardinal directions, encoded within them sacred geometry and mathematics, and used them as a sepulcher. Acharya S. wrote, As Kiel says in Disneyland of the Gods, we know that pyramid building was once a universal practice throughout the world. Over 6,000 years ago, Unknown peoples were assembling great pyramids in Mexico. Gigantic man-made mounds were constructed in China, Great Britain, North America, and on remote Pacific islands while the Egyptians were still living in mud huts along the Nile. During World War II, pilots flying the hump reported seeing one or more massive pyramids standing silently in isolated Himalaya valleys. Of the ubiquitousness and similarity of pyramids, David Hatcher Childress states, Mayan pyramids are found from Central America to as far away as the Indonesian island of Java. The pyramid of Sukha, on the slopes of Mount Lawu, near Surakarta, in central Java, is an amazing temple with stone stele and a steppe pyramid that would match any in the jungles of Central America. The pyramid is in fact virtually identical to the pyramids found at the ancient Mayan site at Waxactun near Tikal. In speaking of the global civilization, Kiel elucidates the weaknesses of the current archaeological paradigm. All these things seem to be interrelated, as if they were once part of some great civilization, a common culture that spread throughout the world and then died. We have a reasonably complete history of the past 2,000 years, and a half-baked archaeological reconstruction of the past 5,000 years. But there are so many gaps in our knowledge that most of the popular archaeological theories really have very little merit. Indeed, we can't even be sure that the Egyptians built the Great Pyramid. In fact, the Great Pyramid is admittedly much more ancient than the Egyptians of history. As Hotema relates, when the most ancient Egyptians first saw the mysterious Sphinx and the Great Pyramid of Giza, only their tops projected above the wind-blown sand of the desert. They knew no more about the purpose of these structures, their builders, or when they were built, than we do. The Great Pyramids at Giza, even by today's standards, are absolute miracles in architecture, masonry, and construction mathematics, and astronomy. The dimensions of the pyramids are extremely accurate, and the site was leveled to within a fraction of an inch over the entire base. This is comparable to the accuracy possible with modern construction and surveying methods and laser leveling. Alan Alford wrote, Beneath the now-removed outer layer, the pyramid's construction consists of approximately 2,500,000 dressed stones, mostly yellow limestone, but with harder granite for certain interior features. The total mass of the Great Pyramid is estimated at around 90 million cubic feet, which would weigh between 6 and 7 million tons. To put this into proper perspective, the highest cathedral nave in Europe would fit three times into its height, and its mass exceeds that of all the cathedrals, churches, and chapels built in England since the beginning of Christianity. The Great Pyramid is often cited as the largest building on Earth, with twice the volume and thirty times the mass of New York's famous Empire State Building. The pyramid rests on an artificially leveled platform, which is less than 22 inches thick, yet is still almost perfectly level, with errors of less than an inch across its entire area, despite supporting such an enormous weight for thousands of years. The base of the pyramid is set out perfectly square, no mean feat of engineering in itself. Up until the last millennium, the pyramids were covered completely with smooth, polished limestone casing blocks. In other words, the pyramids were not an irregular-looking series of steps with a missing capstone like they are now. They were covered with 115,000 ten-ton casing sheets of polished limestone, fitted so perfectly that a razor's edge couldn't get between the casings, 
less than one-fiftieth of an inch. The Egyptians wrote how it reflected the sun like a mirror on all sides. Today, there are still a few polished casings left over at the base of one side. Alan Alford wrote, Our first example of 20th century engineering in the Giza pyramids is the six-sided limestone casing blocks, which were polished and precision carved to fit perfectly with each other and the core stones, with joints measuring less than one-fiftieth of an inch. As if this was not incredible enough, all of these stones were found to be joined together with an extremely fine but strong cement, which had been applied evenly on semi-vertical faces across a surface expanse covering twenty-one acres on the Great Pyramid alone. The second example is the internal passages of the Great Pyramid. These passages have been measured countless times and found to be perfectly straight, with a deviation, in the case of the descending passage, of less than one-fiftieth of an inch along its masonry part. Over a length of 150 feet, that is incredible. If one includes the further 200 feet of passage bored through the solid rock, the error is less than one quarter of an inch. Now this is engineering of the highest precision, comparable with 20th century technology, but supposedly achieved 4,500 years ago. Our third example is the machining of granite within the pyramids. One of the first archaeologists to carry out a thorough survey of the pyramid was Petri, who was particularly struck by the granite coffer in the king's chamber. The precision with which the coffer had been carved out of a single block of extremely hard granite struck him as quite remarkable. Petri estimated that diamond-tipped drills would need to have been applied with a pressure of two tons in order to hollow out the granite box. It was not a serious suggestion as to the method actually used, but simply his way of expressing the impossibility of creating that artifact using 19th century technology. It is still a difficult challenge even with 20th century technology, and yet we are supposed to believe that Khufu achieved this at a time when the Egyptians possessed only the most basic copper hand tools. Under the pyramids are large tunnels, hundreds of meters deep, drilled into limestone bedrock with almost perfect 90 degree angles. This kind of drilling technology has only existed in our current paradigm, for under a century. So how were they drilling, chiseling, and lifting all these megalithic structures? In a famous meeting with a panel of Egyptologists, author of Giza Power Plant, Christopher Dunn, brought a slab of granite, a hammer, and a copper chisel, and asked for a demonstration of how Egyptians were supposed to have chiseled out thousand-ton granite obelisks using simple hand tools. After a few whacks at it, the copper chisel had a deep indent, and not a chip of granite was displaced. Alan Alford wrote, Chris Dunn found that many artifacts bore the same marks as conventional 20th century machining methods, sawing, lathe, and milling practices. He was particularly interested, however, in the evidence of a modern processing technique known as trepanning. This process is used to excavate a hollow in a block of hard stone by first drilling and then breaking out the remaining core. Petri had studied both the hollows and the cores, and been astonished to find spiral grooves on the core which indicated a drill feed rate of 0.1 inches per revolution of the drill. This initially seemed to be impossible. In 1983, Dunn had ascertained that industrial diamond drills could cut granite with a drill rotation speed of 900 revolutions per minute and a feed rate of 0 0.0002 inches per revolution. What these technicalities actually mean is that the ancient Egyptians were cutting their granite with a feed rate 500 times greater than 1983 technology. W. M. Petri wrote, On the granite core, the spiral of the cut sinks one inch in the circumference of six inches, a rate of plowing out which is astonishing. These rapid spiral grooves cannot be ascribed to anything but the descent of the drill into the granite under enormous pressure. Graham Hancock wrote, Wasn't it peculiar 
that at the supposed dawn of human civilization, more than 4,500 years ago, the ancient Egyptians had acquired what sounded like industrial age drills, packing a ton or more of punch, and capable of slicking through hard stones like hot knives through butter. W. M. Petrie wrote, In the first and second pyramids in Giza, there are granite portcullises in the lower passages which still baffle experts today. Firstly, their complex designs suggest a use much more advanced than deterring robbers, the Egyptologist explanation. It would take about fifty men to lift the portcullis slabs into place, yet the narrow corridors they are positioned into could have only been occupied by a few men at a time. The pyramids also encode high mathematics supposedly unknown to the simple ancient Egyptians. To begin with, the pyramids are located precisely on the 30th degree latitude and aligned to within three arc minutes of true north. These are beyond coincidence, so it can be assumed that they could very accurately measure both latitude and longitude. The ratio of the Great Pyramid's height to its base perimeter is exactly pi, 3.14. The King's Chamber and other rooms are perfect golden rectangles, expressing the mystical number of phi, 1.618. The ratio between successive numbers in the Fibonacci sequence increasingly approach phi as you go on from 0, 1, 1, 2, 3, 5, 8, 13, 21, 34. The resulting graph is known as the fractal golden spiral and looks like a conch shell. Establishment Egyptologists say these mathematical considerations are all coincidence, maintaining that ancient Egyptians didn't possess these concepts. But the reality is, the ancient Egyptians did possess higher math, and they purposely encoded it into their construction. Graham Hancock wrote, some routine mathematical games were built into the dimensions of the sarcophagus. For example, it had an internal volume of 1,166.4 liters, and an external volume of exactly twice that, 2,332.8 liters. Such a precise coincidence could not have been arrived at accidentally. The walls of the coffer had been cut to machine-age tolerances by craftsmen of enormous skill and experience. In the king's chamber, the floor diagonal is precisely twice the room's height. W. M. Petrie says, They managed to place the king's chamber perfectly where the vertical section of the pyramid was halved, where the area of the horizontal section was half that of the base, where the diagonal from corner to corner was equal to the length of the base, and where the width of the face was equal to half the diagonal of the base. Do you suppose these mathematics were accidental? Egyptologists say that the Giza pyramids were built for three pharaohs over the course of a hundred years. There are over 2.5 million stones, so if you build 24 hours a day for a hundred years, that means fitting one average 3.5 ton stone into place every 8.5 minutes. Using current technology, multiple cranes and work crews we still couldn't make that kind of time, nor could we match the craftsmanship. Six million tons of stone, underground tunnels, chambers, corridors, 45 and 90 degree shafts, pi and phi ratios, golden rectangles, and other mathematical inclusions, perfect cardinal alignments, right angles, astrological considerations, and flawless masonry. How did ancient man the whole world over build these huge, magnificent pyramids. They stacked stones so heavy, many of which cannot be lifted into place with the technology and machinery available today. They quarried these stones from miles away and fitted them together so seamlessly that you can't fit a blade between them. Also in Egypt, tens of thousands of diorite bowls have been found with hieroglyphs engraved. Diorite is one of the hardest stones on earth, harder than iron, yet intricate inscriptions have been made not through the use of chisels or scraping, but some unknown ancient technology. Whatever it was, was capable of etching lines one one hundred and fiftieth of an inch wide, often in sets of parallel lines separated by a mere one thirtieth of an inch. 
the same kind of workmanship has been found in vases, urns, and other pottery unearthed at the Pyramid of Zoser. Graham Hancock says, There was no technology known to have been available to the ancient Egyptians capable of achieving such results, nor, for that matter, would any stone carver today be able to match them, even if he were working with the best tungsten carbide tools. The implication, therefore, is that an unknown or secret technology had been put to use in ancient Egypt. The Sphinx, which Egyptologists say is less than 5,000 years old, is actually at least 10,000 years old based on its weathering alone. Geologists confirm that it has been eroded by massive amounts of water which hasn't been present in the Sahara for about 10,000 years. Egyptologists claim this weathering is just wind and sand erosion, but geologists like Robert Schock find that hard to swallow. Albert Alford wrote, In October 1991, Dr. Robert Schock, a geologist at Boston University, presented detailed evidence that the Sphinx was thousands of years older than the commonly accepted date of 2500 BC. His conclusion was based on the weathering profile of the limestone rock out of which the Sphinx had been carved. Visitors to the Sphinx today can clearly see the vertical weathering profile in the limestone trench surrounding the Sphinx. This erosion, according to the science of geology, could only be the result of prolonged rainfall, in contrast to the dry weather experienced in Egypt since 2500 BC. Based on the climatic evidence, Schock estimated that the Sphinx had to be between 9,000 and 12,000 years old when the climate in Egypt was much wetter. Acharya S. wrote, In fact, although Egypt is often given the honor of being the originator of much human culture, the Egyptians themselves recorded that they were the inheritors of a great civilization that came from elsewhere. Indeed, the Egyptian culture seemingly appeared out of nowhere at a high level of development, as did the Sumero, Mesopotamian, and South American. This fact is explainable if the civilizers were advanced groups coming from elsewhere, from lands that had been destroyed by climatic change, war, or other cataclysm. Tlachihuatl, the man-made mountain in Mexico, is a ziggurat three times the size of the Great Pyramid. The base length of the Pyramid of the Sun at Teotihuacan is almost identical in length to the base of the Great Pyramid at Giza. What are those odds? Teotihuacan means the place where men become gods. They claim their pyramids and temples were instruments for transforming the soul after death, exactly as the Egyptians did. This theme is all over the ancient world. Ancient Tibetans, the Egyptians, and Native Americans all had complex systems multi-stage challenges for recently deceased souls to overcome in the afterlife. Specific stages of the different cultures' afterlife journeys even match up. The Mayans and the Egyptians both believed in stellar rebirth, where kings, pharaohs, and heroes die and are reborn as stars. And Colin Renfrew wrote, Archaeologists all over the world have realized that much of prehistory as written in the existing textbooks, is inadequate, some of it, quite simply, wrong. It has been suggested that the changes now at work in prehistory herald the shift to a new paradigm, made necessary by the collapse of the first paradigm.